Good morning, everyone. This is Mike Munster from the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic here at North Carolina State University's main campus. And I'm speaking to you because our moderator for the day, Dr. Barbara Shu, had technical problems with her computer power and is struggling to reconnect with her laptop as we speak. She may be down here in this office in a few minutes, but asked me to handle the introductions in her absence. Of course, this will be the last plants, pests, and pathogen session for 2014. We do take a break in December, and we'll be back with you in uh, February of 2015. Our featured speaker today is going to be Dr. Barbara Fair from the Department of Horticulture Science, who I know from different outreach activities that she has done and that we've participated in. She's an expert in trees in particular, and what I know about correct transplanting of trees is come from her. She will be talking today, though, about pruning, and we're also waiting for her to come online because she has a class before this, as I have a class in a few minutes here, and we'll be stepping away and letting the others take over. But before we go any further, let me introduce our technical moderator, Lee J. Temple, who will talk about the techniques for using the Collaborate interface. Thanks, for Mike. Those who uh, are good morning, everyone. This is Lee J. Uh, I am going to walk you through the basics of the interface just so that you can interact with the content and the presenters. On the left-hand side, at the very top, uh, under audio and video, you'll see a talk button. If you have um, something that you would like to ask or to uh, interject, you can click on that button um, to talk into your microphone. But we ask that when you're done, that you click the talk button off, and um, that will prevent feedback from occurring. In the participants area, right below that, um, you should see your name and then four buttons that are emoticons. You can um, click on um, smiley face or approval or applause. Um, if you need to step away, you can click the button next to it to step away from the session. And if you have a question, um, you can click the button to raise your hand. Um, the last button is a checkbox, and I want you to go ahead and click on the yes um, green check if you see that with me. Okay, awesome, folks are awesome. So um, as people have uh, yes or no questions, um, you'll see the check or the red X. If there are multiple answers, that check will turn to an A um, for A, B, C, D. Uh, options. Below uh, the participant list, you have a chat. Um, it is supervised, so we can see anything um, that you type, even if it's just to uh, uh, one other person. So uh, try to keep on topic. But if you have a question, type it into the chat window, um, and either I or one of the other moderators um, can address your question. Um, one thing that we would like for you to do today is to let us know uh, where you're listening in. So if you'll click on um, right beside the map, there's an icon that looks kind of like a sun. If you'll click on that and then click on the area on the map where you are, that'll let us know where our viewers are today. All right, back to you, Mike. Thanks, Lee Jane. I don't see Barbara logged in here yet, Barbara Fair or Barbara Shu. So, Matt, would you be ready to go and do your section while we wait for Barbara? Yeah, that'll be fine. Um, I don't know if we have to move the order of the slides or if I should just go to my slide. Um, but can, I'm willing um, to start. Click on the drop down box, Matt, and mm -hmm. um, go to where your slides start and then just you know, page forward from there. Okay. That's probably the easiest way. Let's see. There we go. All right. So, uh, yeah, I guess we'll wait for Barbara and. Uh, 
you know, I know with all these class schedules and everything, it's difficult sometimes. But um, luckily, I'm not teaching a class this semester, so uh, we'll talk about uh, some insects now. Um, so, as long as everyone's ready, uh, today I uh, thought I'd do something different, kind of similar to last year, one subject for, for the entire talk, um, and a relevant one because of some of the things I've gotten in this year, and that is blood feeders. So, nice relevant topic for Halloween. Uh, and uh, basically kind of vampire stories, things like that, but basically um, blood suckers. So actually, uh, I first have a little interactive thing. So people out there, if you will t use your uh, the text button or the text box, if you would, just please type in what comes to mind when you think of blood feeding animals, just to get an idea of what, what people are thinking about mostly. Um, and that will be, up. Oh, there we go, mosquitoes, okay, what else is people thinking of mosquitoes, I have a feeling that's going to be a big answer, a lot of common answer, bats, ooh, that's a good one, especially for Halloween. Okay, we got bats and mosquitoes, the only blood feeding animals. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Okay. Uh anybody else have anything that they're thinking of? Ticks, that's a good one. Okay. Leeches, okay. All right. So, uh those are probably some really common ones that people think of, but um today I will talk about basically hematophagous arthropods. And hematophagous is just a fancy word for blood feeding and is usually on vertebrates. Uh, there really isn't a technical term for, the, for feeding on insects, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but many of the organisms that live on our planet actually get some or all of their nutrients by feeding on blood. Uh, the ones that get some are called facultative. This may be that they're chewing on hair or feathers and they happen to take blood or um, it's a nice meal, extra meal. But many of the uh, things that we're going to talk about today are all obligate, which means they at least need blood in some part of their life, if not their entire life. Now, other than the arthropods, uh, animals that suck blood fall in actually only a few categories, uh, arthropods being the most common. Uh, so for instance, most leeches, uh, some nematode worms, of course vampire bats, somebody mentioned bats, um, some fish uh, like the South American candaroo and things like that uh, feed on blood of other fish and humans. Uh, some birds, which is surprising, like some oxpeckers and some things that are related to livestock and uh, larger animals, they will not only feed on uh, ticks and things like that, but some will actually open wounds and drink blood, which is kind of horrific. And humans, you know, blood sausage, there's some cultures where blood is actually eaten, which is pretty crazy. Um, now, uh, with insects and arthropods, the bites often produce itchy reactions in this to the saliva normally. And so these are the bites that we get. So, uh, without further ado, here are some arthropods, or the arthropods, and I'm focusing on North Carolina, particularly things that are be found in North Carolina. There are obviously some exotic creatures that are crazy and they're blood sucking, but uh, I'm going to stick to North Carolina. Okay, so um, there's two different modes of blood sucking. Uh, and really, actually, sucking is just one kind of. So there's a piercing versus lapping. So there's a term called selenophagy or selenophagus versus telmophagus. Now, selenophagus organisms pierce the skin and draw the blood up, kind of like a straw. And that's exemplified by mosquitoes uh, piercing the skin and uh, tapping into blood vessels. Now, telmophagus insects actually slice the skin up, uh, like they have little scalpels almost, and then they lap up the blood that pools on the surface. Now, uh, this is exemplified here by a very large horsefly feeding on somebody. 
Now, uh, selenophagous insects are usually less uh, noticeable. You won't feel their bites right away because they're tapping in. Whereas, obviously, even very small insects that slice open the skin are going to create much more pain. Uh, and then they drink the blood that wells on the surface. Um, now, the uh, most common group of blood feeding arthropods are the diptera, the true flies. Uh, there are over 7,000 species that feed on blood in the world, and about 18 families. It's actually originated at least 12 times in flies uh, blood feeding, so they're very successful blood feeders. This also means that many of them transmit diseases, and some are, of course, very important worldwide. For instance, malaria, things like that, uh, are very uh, common killers of people. Now, sometimes it's actually the larvae that are the blood feeders. One of my favorites is called the Congo floor maggot, which actually is called that because if you sleep on floors in Africa, uh, you can have these little maggots come up to you and pierce your skin and try and suck your blood. So that's pretty delightful. Um, now, uh, some groups only feed on other animals, and others bite animals and humans. So I'll discuss some of those now. All right, the first and most popular or most infamous and unpopular are the mosquitoes. Now, I would gather that almost no one has not been bitten by mosquitoes. I think almost everyone has. Um, now, it's only the females that suck blood. Uh, but the females and males will also take nectar from flowers. Uh, the nectar is kind of a high energy resource to fly, and the blood is used for developing eggs. Now, speaking of that, some females do require blood for the development of eggs. This is called anautogenous, uh, while others do not. So they are called autogenous, which means they can automatically produce uh, eggs, and then they feed on blood to be able to develop next broods of eggs. Um, and so they bite. Uh, there is one species of mosquito that doesn't bite around here, the elephant mosquito. I think I've mentioned in previous pest pathogens. Uh, but for the most part, we're going to have these mosquitoes biting birds, mammals, even reptiles and amphibians, and humans. Now, they can vector diseases, of course. In the U.S., we don't have too many diseases that they vector. Uh, but the most common are called the encephalitides, which are things like West Nile virus, uh, Eastern equine encephalitis, lacrosse encephalitis, uh, viruses that cause fever-like symptoms and cause swelling of the brain. Uh, and that's where the uh, death is involved. Uh, the larvae breed in water and are sometimes adapted to containers. So keeping containers clear of water in your, around your home is key to controlling mosquitoes. Of course, if you live on a salt marsh or some big watery area, it's going to be much more difficult. OK. The next group, uh, we've actually, I've actually gotten a couple calls about, uh, I haven't seen these, uh, seen the samples, the specimens per se, but people have described these flies that sound a lot like black flies, which are also called buffalo gnats. Uh, these are small, gray-black, and hump-backed flies. Now again, only the females feed on blood, and they do have very painful bites. So these are going to be a type that uh, slices the skin open and sucks the blood that comes to the top. Now, in other parts of the world, they do transmit diseases, especially in Africa and South America. They can transmit a worm that causes river blindness. Uh, but here in the U.S., they're really not going to be tra transmitting diseases. However, in some areas, especially in the northern latitudes, we've got lots of cool, uh, ox well oxygenated streams where their larvae live. Uh, you can get huge swarms of them that can be so abundant on livestock that they can actually drink so much blood from them that they will kill the livestock. Um, and they also can have a saliva that causes toxic shock. So while we don't have a lot of them here, especially in the Piedmont and the coast, because we don't have a lot of these fast-moving streams that, they're, that the larvae are associated with, in the mountains they can be more of a problem. Um, and just know that their habitat is where they're coming from. The larvae require uh, fast-flowing, well-oxygenated streams. OK. Now, even smaller flies are the biting midges, the ceratopogonidae. Uh, they're also called punkies or noceums or sometimes sandflies, although I'll tell you another 
a member of uh, the flies that's called that. And they're among the smallest of flies, and not only among the smallest of biting flies. So most are about a one to two millimeters. I actually went down to the beach last weekend, and these uh, culicoides were all over the place, uh, especially at, uh, in dusk and dawn. Um, and you can see how small they are in relation to these hairs. And the funny thing is they do slice open the skin a little bit and they drink the blood, so it is actually a fairly painful bite for such a tiny, tiny fly that can actually almost rest on the leg of a mosquito. Um, so um, again, in this group, and this is the lower flies, the more primitive flies, only the females feed on blood. Um, however, that's only a few different species that live around here. Most other group, most other species in the family are predators of other insects or they feed on the blood of other arthropods. This actually, the bottom photo is one of these punkies feeding on the leg of a daddy long legs. So not only do we get bitten and sucked on, these other, other insects and other arthropods can actually have that happen to them. And these flies are so tiny that that's again a daddy long legs leg. So very, very tiny. Um, they're often an issue around marshy or coastal habits, habitats. That's where the larvae live. The larvae are semi-aquatic to somewhat terrestrial under bark and things like that of rotting logs. Um, and really the only worry concern is for farmers or people with livestock because they can transmit viruses to livestock like sheep uh, and goats, a uh, virus called blue tongue virus. However, uh, People, uh, you'll get a nasty bite, but that's, you know, that might be the worst of it. Um, okay, so the biting midges, actually one of my favorite groups. Uh, I should mention that they are important to us in one critical way, in that they are the only group of insects that pollinates chocolate in the tropics. So you have them to thank for that. So uh, I guess there's that. Okay, moving on. Um, horse and deer flies. Uh, these are some of the largest of our blood feeders and also the largest family of blood feeders. There are over 4,500 species. There are all over 1,000 species more than in mosquitoes, basically. Um, now, again, only females feed on blood. Males and females will take nectar. Um, now, the larvae are usually in saturated, muddy habitats and are predators. They're pretty amazing in their own right. They often live in the saturated soil in on the banks of ponds and streams where they hunt for prey uh, and they have a venomous bite, very large maggots, uh, well over an inch long, many of them. And they can they have even been reported to feed on frogs and things like that and small amphibians. So they're pretty powerful uh, little little guys. Now they can sometimes transmit bacterial diseases and they transmit other diseases like some, some types of worms and things like that in other countries and other continents. Uh, here they, uh, they can transmit some disease, some bacteria like I said, but it's not very common. Um, now often these have very colorful eyes. You can see this deer fly has very nice, nicely patterned eyes as does this green head, what most people call them at the beach. Uh, but again, they're very painful biters. They've got very large mouth parts, very sharp mouth parts, and they will um, basically make a very large wound where they can access the blood. Uh, very annoying, uh, very beautiful though, I think. <laughs> okay, now moving up to the higher flies. Uh, one main group of higher flies are the muscoid flies, so the family Musidae. This includes the house fly, but it also includes several biting flies. Um, the one that most people will be concerned about will be the stable fly, Stomoxys calcitrans. Uh, but if you're rearing livestock or you have a farm with livestock, horn flies, Hematobia irritans, can be a problem. Now, they do resemble house flies. The stable fly is very much like a house fly, very similar in size, too. But this group has this long proboscis that's hardened and at the tip, instead of a fleshy mouth parts that house flies have, they have very hardened teeth, which they use to rasp the, the skin and drink the blood. Now in this group, uh, both males and females feed on blood and they don't feed on anything else really. They may take nectar, but they're both concerned with feeding on blood. Now, stable flies usually feed on pets, uh, specifically dogs uh, that are outside, uh, and livestock, but will bite humans. I've had them 
uh, congregate on my legs before, and they do have very painful bites. Horn flies do not feed on humans, but are, you can see, can be very abundant on cattle uh, and can become an issue where they, uh, they annoy and suck a lot of the blood out of the cattle. Now, just to mention a couple other groups that aren't very common here but do exist, uh, snipe flies in the genus Symphoromaya right here. Uh, these are close relatives of, how, of uh, horse flies, uh, smaller, grayer. Uh, they're more of a problem out west, but we do have species here. They're probably feeding on other things, but they can feed on humans. And then true sand flies, the psychotidae uh, in the genus Lutzomaya. These are related to the drain flies or the moth flies that live in your bathrooms. Uh, and they do exist in North Carolina, but I have never seen one. They are not common at all. Uh, but they do cause diseases, transmit diseases in the tropics, especially some very uh, important ones, uh, including leishmaniasis, which is uh, very deadly for in, uh, in certain areas of the world. Um, now, some other interesting ones that don't bite humans but are actually feeding on animals are going to be, uh, for instance, the louse flies. They're called louse flies because many are wingless or lose their wings. They're flattened and they live, they're very closely associated with mammals and birds. Um, you've got bat flies, which are very, very strange looking creatures, look like spiders almost, very small, and are specialized to live on bats. Uh, there's actually a few fly species and families that are associated with bats. Uh, carnid flies are one of the few uh, acolyptrate flies, acolyptrates being close to uh, fruit flies and uh, things like that. These actually, the females live in bird nests and feed off the baby birds and they become, they lose their wings and they become these large engorged kind of, you know, very small flies but larger uh, when they're engorged with blood. Uh, and lastly, one of the kind of very gross ones are a group of blowflies called the bird blowflies in the genus Protocolifera have maggots that live in nests and suck the blood of baby birds. Uh, pretty horrible, pretty disgusting, um, but it's a good successful way to get some, get some nice protein and uh, flies are just really good at it. Uh, so that's the flies. Now uh, moving on. Uh, there are several other groups of arthropods that are blood feeders as well. So fleas, uh, this is a group that's very closely related to flies, uh, even though they don't at all look like flies. They share, uh, they're probably very closely related. Um, they are very famous jumping insects. They're the flea circuses in which you can train fleas to jump a certain uh, way and uh, have these cool little acts except for their blood feeders. Uh, now, they're always wingless. Uh, they're always flattened side to side, so laterally flattened. Uh, very tiny eyes and a few combs of CD on parts of their body. They're usually an amber-red color and uh, very tough insects. Uh, now, both males and females feed on blood. Now, the larvae are legless and worm-like uh, and live in uh, the cracks of floors or in nests or things like that and feed on adult feces and debris like skin and hair and anything like that. Um, now, they can transmit some diseases, uh, for instance, plague and tapeworm, tapeworms. Uh, so out west where there's prairie dogs, uh, there's plague is actually fairly prevalent in the U.S. Uh, being uh, having the reservoir and prairie dogs, so people doing research out there, they get bit by the fleas, they've got to take the antibiotics because uh, they can pick up the plague pathogen. Uh, plague also happens to kill fleas as well, so not only are we susceptible to it, but it blocks the fleas and keep, makes them bite more and transmit the bacterium. Uh, tapeworms are transmitted when animals feed on fleas. They don't, they're not doing it purposefully, but if uh, a cat or a uh, dog is grooming itself and it happens to ingest a flea, it may have the eggs of a tapeworm in it, which then uh, infests the animal. Uh, now, the most common species we have is the cat flea, Tenocephalites felis. Uh, there is a Tenocephalites canis, the dog flea, and the human flea is Pulex irritans, but it's not very common. 
uh, uh, the cat flea is really the most common flea you're going to have around um, around domestic situations. And again, having pets is mu much more likely to ha have uh, 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 incidents of fleas. Okay, uh, everybody's favorite, the kind of resurgence in this uh, bug has been uh, a boom for entomologists, but obviously not good for people that like to sleep. Uh, so bed bugs and kin. So uh, bed bugs in the family Simicidae are small, flat, reddish brown insects, and they are always wingless. These are a type of true bug, a hemipterin, uh, related to uh, plant bugs and stink bugs and things like that, uh, but they are smallish. Now, a lot of people will think they're really, really small, but I would say that the large adults or fully grown adults are a little smaller than a hole punch uh, point. So uh, just think about that. They are they're a little bit larger than people think. Um, now, all stages and sexes feed on blood. Now, the human bed bug, at least our temperate human bed bug, Cymex leptularius, is the most commonly found one and the one that can survive off of us and reproduce in our homes. Now, it's found uh, around where humans sleep and they move with people and their things. So if you go to a place that's infested with them, you, there's a good chance that you may bring one or two back. And if you have a female that has eggs, uh, you can, they can have build up a population in your home, and it doesn't matter how clean the home is, how messy, uh, you know, they're kind of equal opportunity parasites. Now, they do not transmit diseases, which is fortunate for us, but can it be an extreme nuisance because certain people uh, react badly to their bites. They get red, big red welts on them. Uh, it obviously causes distress, you, you know, having trouble sleeping, things like that. They are also very, fairly difficult to control, uh, but pest control operators can uh, supply you with a number of options on how to control them if you identify them in your home. Now, uh, one of the things that spurred me to get to talk about blood feeding insects now is because this year we actually had a few samples of some different ones. Uh, so I said bed bugs and kin because there are several species and genera that are very close looking to our bed bugs, but are not. Um, so these are other bed bugs. Um, these all need animal hosts, but will bite people. They can't survive off of people, but they, uh, if their animal host goes, they will come off and they will try and probe people and, and suck our blood, even though the blood won't uh, let them reproduce. So for instance, bat bugs, Cymex adjunctus, uh, very, very similar to uh, our bed bug. Um, but is more hairy, especially the hairs around the pronotum are very long, longer than the eye width, or eye, 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 uh, yeah, the eye width. Uh, that's the way you distinguish them from our bed bugs. And they do infest bats, so if you have bats roosting in your attic, uh, the bats leave. The bugs have nothing else to feed on, so they'll start to wander around. Now, some of them will hitch rides on the bats to other roosts, uh, but others will come through vents and such and bite people, but will die off fairly quickly. Uh, so people will get bitten, they'll bring in these insects, they think they have bed bugs, but luckily it's just bat bugs and they will, they will go, go away over time without their host. Uh, swallow bugs are similar. Um, these are covered in thick hairs uh, and they infest swallow roosts. So barn swallows sometimes, but other swallows, cliff swallows more commonly. And again, when their hosts are gone, they will start to walk away and uh, may bite people. Lastly, the, one of the very interesting ones I got in was the chimney swift bug uh, on the right. Uh, they infest chimney swift nests. So um, I got a call in from a client who uh, they found this nest made of sticks and glued together with spit, uh, and there were these bugs coming in and biting people. Well, I uh, identified them as this Cymexopsis nictalis, this chimney swift bug, and uh, apparently it is only associated with chimney swifts, and chimney swifts are largely associated with our chimneys now only. So they do live in close proximity to people, but uh, they only feed on the chimney swifts 
when the birds leave, when the birds fledge, they have nothing to feed on. They're wingless, so again, they can't fly to other places. So they crawl out of the chimneys and uh, may begin to feed on people a little bit uh, before they end up dying. So just be aware that not every bed bug-like insect is an actual bed bug that can survive in homes, but some of them are associated with animals that are around our homes. Another bug, a true bug, a uh, hemipterin, are a group of bugs, the kissing bugs, uh, a delightful name for a pretty horrid bug. Uh, they're called kissing bugs because uh, oftentimes, uh, especially in uh, down in the tropics, they will come onto people when they're sleeping, uh, when the people are sleeping, and feed near the lips because it's a very soft area, very easy to access. And so they're called kissing bugs, uh, but you do not want to have them kissing you, obviously. This is a subfamily of assassin bugs. So most assassin bugs are predators, uh, but tritomini are all blood feeders uh, as nymphs as adults and uh, and everything basically both sexes now we do have a native one here in North Carolina the eastern blood sucking cone nose triatoma sanguisuga um, I was fortunate enough uh, to get a specimen in here at the top um, and take some photos um, and uh, they are large very large for blood feeders They're about an inch long very brightly colored uh, there are some other assassin bugs that look similar, uh, have these similar bright colors, uh, but the cone noses obviously have this nice conical nose. Uh, the, the rostrum, the actually the tip of the head is conical versus usually thicker in other assassin bugs. It also doesn't have very uh, large uh, raptorial front legs to grab prey because it doesn't need that to, and has a fairly thin rostrum. Uh, now, they are fairly uncommon, but present in North Carolina. Uh, most of the ones that are here feed on rodents. You can see this one is actually feeding on the foot of a mouse. Um, and But they may attack humans, so that's why I want to make people aware of them. Now, in the tropics, they transmit a very serious disease called Chagas disease. This is uh, caused by Trypanosoma cruzi, uh, which is in the same genus as the sleeping sickness in Africa. Uh, now, the reason they don't transmit it here is because it needs to be transmitted through their feces. So when they bite humans, the bite becomes itchy, uh, then they defecate on the face, and people itch their bites and uh, get feces in them. Well, fortunately, the ones in North America don't do that. They leave the host before they defecate. They're very, uh, they're very nice that way. Um, but uh, they don't transmit the disease here, even though they can carry it. Um, so kissing bugs are just something to be aware of. Uh, they're a really weird group. Uh, they will even steal blood from each other. They'll pierce each other and drink the blood right out of the belly of the other one. So they're kind of crazy. OK, uh, sucking lice, the anaplura, which are now, we know, uh, just a very, very specialized bark lice and book lice, um, although they don't look like them. These are very tiny, two to three millimeter long wingless insects and very adapted to living in hair. Uh, they have these very well adapted legs that grasp on the hair specific to certain animals. Now there are many species in the world, but only two on humans. The head and body louse, Pediculus humanus, and the pubic louse, uh, or the crab louse, Therus pubis. These all glue eggs, to the, uh, which are called nits, to either hair which is in the case of the head and pubic lice, or clothing, which is in the case of the, pub of the body lice. Um, that's where the term actually nit picking comes from, is picking out the eggs of lice. Now, they cannot live long off the host, so they really need to be in contact. So sharing a hat, uh, you know, um, contact, hair-to-hair -hair contact kind of thing, uh, they need, because again, they don't have wings, they can't jump, they really have to crawl to their new hosts. Now, in certain situations, they can transmit, can transmit diseases, uh, but not likely at home or the ones that come, your kids come home from school with. Uh, these are going to be the diseases will be epidemic typhus and relapsing fever, uh, both for Ketsia species. Um, this is actually one of, the, one of the biggest things that destroyed and decimated Napoleon's armies in Africa was a huge case, hundreds of, you know, tens of thousands of, uh, of soldiers killed 
uh, by epidemic typhus spread by body lice that were in the clothing. Uh, and in the close situations, you get these diseases to spread. Um, otherwise, uh, typical lice treatments, uh, you know, worrying about the lice is more important than the diseases. Okay, now out of the insects and into a couple of arachnids. So ticks, uh, the exodida, this is, can, includes hard ticks and soft ticks. I won't talk about soft tick ticks, they're not very common. Uh, but the hard ticks are very common in North Carolina. Now, all life stages and sexes feed on blood. They do only take one blood meal per stage. So they will fill up on blood, molt, and then fill up on blood and molt. And uh, so they only take a few blood meals, really, but they can cause significant uh, concern. Now, the larvae have six legs, like all mites, because ticks are really just big mites. Um, whereas the nymphs and adults have eight legs. So you can see here, these are adults. They have uh, eight legs, just like most arachnids. Now, some alternate hosts, like deer ticks, for instance, start out on mice and go to deer. Um, but others are specific to hosts. For instance, the rabbit tick only feeds on rabbits. Uh, there are three main genera that we have to be concerned about as humans in North Carolina. These are amblyoma, the lone star ticks, shown here, a uh, female and a male. Uh, of course, the female is called lone star. Is the, it gives the name for the lone star tick because it's got this dot in the middle of its body. Uh, and also Dermacenter and Exodes, which I'll show you in a second. Now, they take a while to fully engorge, uh, and usually you don't have to be concerned if you catch them within 12 to 24 hours. However, they do transmit diseases, most of which are specific to certain tick types. For instance, Amplioma americanum, the Lone Star tick, uh, isn't very good at transmitting typical diseases, but there's the new allergy that they're uh, contributing to, and there's a, 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 an illness called Southern, uh, or um, uh, it's called Star Eye. It's a Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. Uh, it creates a rash. Now, the ones to be more concerned about, although they're not as commonly on people in North Carolina as the Lone Star Tick, are the dog and wood ticks, the Dermacenter species. Uh, these are about the size of Lone Star Ticks. Uh, they're teardrop shaped, more than rounded, and have short mouth parts. Uh, they can transmit Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is another Rickettsia species. Uh, it's a bacterium, a spirochete. Uh, now, everybody's really afraid of the deer ticks, the exodes. These are small. These are the smallest ticks as adults. They have very dark legs and a dark carapace and long mouth parts, as well as a long body. They can transmit Lyme disease, which is the most uh, fearsome of all the diseases transmitted by ticks. However, I don't really see ticks very commonly, uh, or deer ticks very commonly. Most often I see lone star ticks, then Dermacenter, and very rarely, I don't, I've never actually seen an Exodes in North Carolina, though they do exist. Okay. Lastly, uh, bird mites. Uh, these are ornithinesis uh, species. They are minute, less than a millimeter. So here's one on a toothpick, and here's, one, here's some on a penny. So you can see they're very small arthropods. Uh, three species in the genus Ornithinesis can become issues either on poultry or sometimes uh, on humans when there is no poultry available. Uh, the northern foul mite, Ornithinesis sylviarum, the tropical foul mite, Ornithinesis bursa, and the tropical rat mite, Ornithinesis bacodi, uh, which is on rats rather than, and rodents rather than fowl. Uh, now they do feed on nesting birds or on poultry and will bite humans if the host leaves. However, again, like these specific bed bugs, uh, the animal-specific bed bugs, these mites will only, uh, can only feed on humans for a short period of time before they die off because they can't survive off of us. They do not transmit diseases um, and, uh, like I said, cannot pr reproduce on human bud, blood. Now, one of the things I'm mentioning about this is that we got this in a, a true case of this. But they are not very common. And there's a website out there called Bird, all, of all About Bird Mites that convinces people that if they're getting bites, these are bird mites. Uh, this is often, the bird mites are often blamed in delusory parasitosis cases where people think they're getting bitten by something, but it's some other thing, either an allergic reaction, dermatitis, or something psychological, or drug use, alcohol use. But bird mites are so small that people blame them because they can't see them, but they're getting bitten, in quotes. 
Uh, so basically identifying that you have bird mites for sure is the best uh, way. Uh, obviously collecting specimens, knowing that bird mites is the first step in controlling them. Uh, otherwise, there really have to be some other um, routes taken to figure out what's going on with the people. Okay, now there are a few other biters, things that might bite people but don't actually suck blood. So chiggers, tromiculi, this is a common uh, group of uh, arachnids, mites. They actually liquefy the skin and feed on the liquid. So the, first of all, they don't feed on blood. They also do not burrow under skin. That's, uh, that's an old wives' tale. Um, you, once, you're the, once the bite presents, they're gone. They've already liquefied the skin and dropped off. So you don't need to cover them with uh, nail polish or whatever and all these kind of tricks. By the time you see the bites, they're gone. Uh, scabies is another mite. Uh, it doesn't feed on blood, but it burrows under the skin and feeds on the skin. Um, and this is basically considered a dermatological issue. So go to your dermatologist, they'll give you some topical or drugs, and this will help uh, kill the mites that are under the skin. And it causes basically just a rough, kind of itchy area. Thrips, these are plant feeders mostly, some are predators, uh, but I've seen, I've had them swarming and walk through the swarm, they land on your skin and they will probe with their mouth parts and this can actually be kind of painful. Uh, they're not sucking your blood, but they can bite. This is the same as, it uh, goes true for some of the small leaf hoppers and other true bugs. They can actually uh, land on your skin and probe your skin with their mouth parts, even if they're plant feeders, and it may produce a bite or a, uh, or introduce some bacteria and cause an infection, but they're not trying to suck your blood. They're not trying to do that. It's just a weird probing that they do. Lastly, lacewing larvae. I've been bitten by them a few times. Uh, they will liberally bite when in contact with skin, and they do have a painful venom that, uh, that hurts. Uh, and I'm not going to obviously talk about stinging insects. That's for another time. Okay, so how to deal with blood feeders. So when you're out in nature, wear adequate clothing and, uh, and um, basically to protect from them. Tuck your pant legs in your socks when out in tall grass to, to um, keep ticks and things like that from crawling up your, your pants. Use repellents like DEET for flies and ticks. It's better for flies especially, but it is the most effective repellent. Uh, permethrin can be applied to clothing before wearing and letting it dry. This will kill chiggers and ticks, especially on the, the shoes and the pants, but you do not want to apply it to your skin. It is poisonous to people. Uh, fogging yards can kill mosquitoes, but also will kill other things in your yard. So I really don't suggest fogging yards as a good way. You know, emptying containers and wearing DEET are the best things. And household biters like fleas and uh, bed bugs, it's best to call a PCO, pest control operator. Okay, so a quick quiz, um, blood feeders quiz. Which of these insects do not transmit diseases? Uh, a, deer flies, B, mosquitoes, C, bed bugs, or D, fleas? Okay, we've got All right, it's pretty unanimous. Okay, good. Although they are annoying, the only one of the saving graces of bed bugs is that they do not transmit diseases. Uh, so everybody got that right that answered. Um, the other ones, as I mentioned, can transmit diseases, although they are not very common in North Carolina. We have very few people succumbing to diseases that are transmitted by um, arthropods, although again, they are, they, you know, ticks, mosquitoes, and uh, fleas. Well, ticks and mosquitoes are the most important uh, disease carriers in North Carolina. Um, okay, uh, so that's it for blood feeders. Um, just uh, one bolo, be on the lookout for household evaders. I'll probably say this every year at this time. There are going to be some insects that overwinter as adults and they will start to enter homes thinking it's a natural cave or a natural place to live uh, and sleep over the winter. Of course, we're not too happy to have them in there. So true bugs, like stink bugs especially, the brown marmorated stink bug here, 
Uh, Leaf-footed bugs and box elder bugs, kudzu bugs, things like that will come into homes. Ladybugs also are known to swarm this year, this time of year, where they're going to overwinter, as well as cluster flies. I actually saw one on my house yesterday. Uh, these very golden uh, CD on the thorax uh, tell you that it's a cluster fly. Um, again, these will overwinter in homes, but can be vacuumed up or just gotten rid of physically. Uh, it's not very good to really spray, spray chemicals. And with that, uh, hopefully uh, the next person is ready to speak. And uh, I'll let, it, let them take over. Thanks, Matt, for taking over on the fly like that. Barbara Fair is here now. And um, if we've got the slides in right order, I think we'll be ready to go. All right, our speaker today is Barbara Fair in the Department of Horticulture, uh, does many uh, programs. Uh, one of the major ones is uh, one of the field days out at the uh, Arboretum. And with that really brief introduction, I'm going to let Barbara take it away. OK. Yeah, you want to make sure you can hear me? Can everybody hear me OK? Yep. Okay. Great, thanks. So I apologize for not getting on the first thing this morning. I, I'm a little bit technologically challenged, so that's part of the issue there. Uh, but without any further ado, let's get started. So we are going to talk about pruning today. Which button? Sorry, we're still working on buttons and such. OK, hang on. We're going to switch computers. All right, are we back on track? Can everybody hear me? Okay. How we go how we all doing? <laughs> Can you all hear me now? All right, excellent. So our objectives of pruning. The first thing you have to ask yourself is why are you pruning a particular plant? Because anytime you prune a plant, you're often removing live plant material. And the plant needs those leaves and stems and such in order to produce food for the rest of the plant for its growth and its maintenance and uh, defense against insects and disease. So it may not be quite as important when you're talking about shrubs, uh, but certainly you still ask, you want to ask, are you shaping this plant? Are you trying to increase its growth? So you want to know what plant it is, and then you want to know 
the reason for pruning it? Are you trying to get it to grow faster, get it to grow slower? Are you trying to get it to start over and produce a much better plant? So there's lots of, lots of things that you want to actually think about before pruning. And I think that's oftentimes where uh, many folks kind of hesitate. They don't really think about what they're doing. Uh, particularly with trees, the most important thing to do is start when the plant is young because you're making a small wound at that point, and you can, you're going to get a much better structured plant in the future. Plus, it saves a lot of money when you prune them small, rather than if you have to bring in a, a tree company to come and do the large pruning for you, then it gets to be uh, very expensive, often in the thousands of dollars. So starting when plants are young, uh, this is also a part where we don't put enough uh, resources behind, and, and that's really uh, a, not a good plan. Um, if one thing, too, that I've just really been uh, learning and kind of a change in thoughts from what we used to kind of think about is that if you plant a tree initially and you see that it has a co-dominant leader or some other kind of structural defect, the time to remove it is right then when you plant it. And we used to say, well, you don't want to take any of the crown off because you want to get all that energy to put it into the roots. Well, we're not talking about pruning a boatload of material off of it, but we are saying that you kind of need to um, fix that mistake right then with the plant, and then you can move on from there. Obviously, you want to remove any dead, broken, or diseased branches. I always kind of tease my students about this, because if you're buying a new plant and it's diseased, you probably shouldn't take that plant home with you. Um, so obviously, once a tree is established and it does get a disease, if it's possible to prune that out, like with fire blight, um, then that might be something that you can certainly achieve. So you also want to get good spacing of branches uh, for thinning. Maybe sometimes you are looking to produce more flower or fruit. Some people don't really like fruit in some cases, so they are trying to minimize that. Um, I'm not going to talk at all about uh, produ uh, pruning trees for fruit production like apples and peaches because that's a totally different system of pruning. Uh, where you're not looking at merely the aesthetics of the plant. One really good thing is, is directing the plant's uh, growth. You can pull it away from the sides of buildings. You can control the size with heading back or shearing. Uh, crown reduction is actually a, a thinning cut where you're taking back a, a, an end of a branch back to a lateral branch so that that branch can take over the growth of what you've removed. And usually the standard rule of thumb is about a third the size. So again, why are you pruning this? This is some pruning this uh, gal was doing on some trees in the nursery. One thing I want you to notice is if you look at the lower part, can they see that? If you look at the lower part of the plant down here, you can see where they've left some of the smaller branches on. And the reason for that is, and, and not many nurseries have done this, but it's a really good idea to kind of get to kind of start looking at doing that, because it helps build taper of that tree. And taper is really important in the long term when you're looking at uh, storm resistance. Uh, strong taper is going to help the plant grow much better uh, and be more resistant to winds. Line clearance, totally different kind of pruning as well. Now, they are required to follow the same procedures as any arborist, any certified arborist. They are supposed to cut limbs back to a lateral. Uh, some of you might have heard of some of the issues that they had in Greensboro this past year where they came in and did some line clearance. And as I understand it, the issue there is they hadn't been there for quite a number of years, and they took off quite a bit more on the canopies than they normally do. So for example, the prior clearance was uh, 15 feet on either side of the tree, and now it, is, it has almost doubled. Uh, to get good line clearance. So that means they're taking a lot of plant material off of those plants. But they are still required to do it appropriately. So I guess this doesn't work this way. Sorry about the picture on there. I, I didn't know that you couldn't click on it like a regular PowerPoint. Anyway, what I'm showing is, and you can kind of see the outline of the tree in the back. It's very pyramidal. Uh, that is a, uh, a silver linden. This, of course, is a red maple in the front. It has this very rounded habit, and that's called decurrent growth. The other one, X current growth. So the X current growth has a really dominant central leader, where these other guys tend to have more of a, a number of leaders. 
Now, we still want to try to maintain a single leader on those plants as long as possible. And that may mean we'd have to shorten some of the side branches if they start to grow a little too aggressively. So that way, you're putting more of the energy into those lateral, into that terminal branch. And obviously, getting good material from the, the nursery is really the most important thing. So if you look at these plants, uh, and I've taken these pictures often at my favorite place to take pictures of bad planting, and that's in a Walmart shopping center <laughs> near my home. They've done a couple of things wrong. Number one, this is not how we stake trees anymore. We don't put wire in hoses. Uh, it just doesn't help. This kind of stiff staking that you see on the right there, that also is not very good for plants. It doesn't allow them to move and help build that taper. But this tree is one that should stay on the truck. It has way too many leaders. This is not a tree that you're going to be able to fix uh, quite easily. You'd have to take off a, a number of these branches. And so it's just not worth it. So you want to look for a good tree. And it may actually be kind of a little ugly duckling when you first get it. So how do we remove branches from a tree? And we're going to talk about natural target pruning. And we're looking for two targets on a branch. And this is with any woody plant. You're looking for what we call the branch bark ridge and the branch collar. Okay, So those are the two points you want to look for in order to do a, a thinning cut. So here's a maple. Maples have opposite leaf and branch arrangement. You notice where he's pointing here, where the bright uh, where the little uh, sticks are, this is what we call the branch bark ridge. It looks a little bit like a mustache. Uh, the bark is kind of raised up. Now, this is a great angle cut here. This is a great angle for these branches of great union because it's kind of rounded rather than V-shaped. If it was V-shaped, you, would you wouldn't see this branch bark ridge quite as readily, and there would be bark in between those two. And what happens is as these two grow, they would begin to press on each other and then end up uh, so much pressure that the one would break off. So this is a great branch union, and that's what you kind of want to look for in a plant is that U-shaped union. So we've got this branch bark ridge. Where the yellow arrows are is the branch collar. And you can kind of see on these, it's fairly easy to see on this side because you kind of have these ridges building up. On the other side, not quite as apparent. Okay. So when we're going to make our cut, we want to be sure that we maintain the integrity of that branch collar. And we start up just above where that branch bark ridge is. So if I were going to make a cut on these branches, first I would remove the weight. Then I'd come back in and make my cut right here. And it, you were looking to build a 45 degree angle between the branch bark ridge and where your cut is. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. If, if not, just you know, send me a note, and I'll, I'll continue to explain that. But you're going to see a spot where we're going to be able to show you. So as you can see here, here's our undercut. That takes the weight off of that branch. And then the next cut, this B cut, takes, that's where you take all the weight off. I'm sorry, the bottom cut here is to prevent any ripping down the side here. I've seen it a lot of times. Uh, and it doesn't close that wound over very well because there's not the chemicals there that you need to have in order to make that cut. So you make this small cut, you make your outer cut, it takes off the entire limb, and then you come back and you make your final collar cut. And you'll notice between these two is that 45 degree angle. Did you put that on there for me? Oh, that's OK. So here's just an example of how you're doing it on an actual branch. Now, you know, I'm going to tell you I cheat maybe a little bit in some cases. Like, if I can hold the weight of this branch with one hand, uh, I may not make that little cut there. But that's only if I can hold the weight and I know it's not going to rip down. In the early part of the spring, when, uh, when sap is flowing up into the plant, it tends to get a little bit trickier. And especially on thin bark trees, it's real easy for it to rip. So I, I usually do make that little cut. So that's your first undercut. Then your second cut, you see, takes the weight off. And you can see how this is cracking back. It's going to stop right there where we've made our undercut. And there's the branch removed. Then we come back in for our collar cut. Okay, There's your branch bark ridge. Not as readily uh, visible in this picture, but kind of uh, right about in here, there's your 45 degree angle. So that's a great cut. A lot of people, even now today, still ask me, should you put paint on there? Should you put uh, the, the tree tar on there? Uh, for many, many years, we've been saying no, but they keep selling it at the stores. 
Uh, but anything you put on there, especially that black goopy stuff, it actually seals in moisture and seals in any of those uh, de potential decay-causing organisms. Doesn't take long, they're already in there. The key is making a really good cut, and then that's going to allow the tree to close those wounds over much faster, and you're done. Little, little trick, you can put a little dirt on there, and it'll lighten up that wound if, if you think your clients or whatever are going to be very upset by it. Now, trees will tell you that's a trick of the trade and don't, like, send that around too much, you know. <laughs> we like to keep our, our things quiet. Um, so here is uh, a, a wound that was made that was probably not a correct wound. Anytime you see adventitious sprouts growing around a wound, some trees do it more than others. It may indicate that it wasn't quite the, rec the correct cut. Uh, I've just learned recently, like, I would normally go in there and take all those off. It may not really be necessary. You still have, they're producing food for the plant, so it's still, it's still kind of okay to do that. Now, as you my, as some of you guys that already know me know that this is, uh, this is the bane of my existence right here when I see this kind of pruning. Uh, sadly, this was done by some landscapers who did not know how to prune trees. Um, and so they ended up, uh, doing a fairly terrible job. These are red maples. And as you, if you look close enough, you can already see gloomy scale on, on both of these trees. These are flush cuts. These wounds uh, will certainly have decay in them at some point in time. And then the wound may begin to close over. And I've actually been out to see these uh, recently. And they do have wound wood that is formed around there, but because of the size of this wound, it is likely that you're going to have decay all the way through that, uh, below that tree, especially up and down through that trunk. Okay? It's just not professional. I hate to see it. Not sure what was going on uh, with that cut. And this kind of shows you what happens if you have a flush cut in a tree. You can see that you'll get decay. Uh, this is discolored mostly, but there is a line of decay through here, especially where that flush cut was initially made. Uh, same thing here. Now, this might have been some storm damage as well, uh, but you can see a line of decay through here. So this is certainly something that would require a risk assessment to determine if this branch needs to be removed or if the tree can be shortened to help mitigate that uh, level of risk. Again, just another example of some poor cuts. Not quite flush here, but certainly parts of it are flush, parts of it are not. You can see they've cut off the branch bark ridge. I honestly don't know what happened here. I think they were probably using the, what they call a stick chain, which is a chainsaw on a, uh, with a motor at the base and then a very long, uh, very long pole with a chainsaw end on it. And you can see they kind of lost control of their weapon. <laughs> and I call it a weapon in that case for sure. Um, here's where they failed to do the undercut, uh, and of course they've left stubs on, which we certainly don't want to do. We need that final third cut, but uh, just goes to show you that this can be quite a large, uh, obvious wound if you don't take care of that. Don't know what was going on here. If they, you know, what happened here? Maybe they like this. Maybe they wanted to do some kind of sculpture. I've seen some very cool wood sculptures, so I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt there. Maybe they ran out of cash. Hard to know. So here's some great cuts. This one is almost the one in the far right. Uh, and uh, I want you guys to just think about it yourself. What did they do wrong here, potentially? Uh, these are, are really great cuts. You can see the little, it kind of forms a little, little belly button when this wound would roll, which is that donut of growth, closes over that entire wound. And remember, we, trees don't heal their wounds. Woody plants don't heal their wounds. So they close those wounds off, and then that part of the tree is then isolated. So you have these great ones, looks like a little belly button there, and in time you won't be able to see those. And those are on campus too, and those were done by our, our grounds crew folks. So they knew what they, were, what they were doing there. This one they just missed going a little too deep into that branch bark ridge. I know you guys would love this. That's why I threw a picture of crepe myrtle in here. I would love to say that crepe murder is the perfect example of this, but the problem is, is they don't die. Uh, crepe assault, crepe manslaughter. Um, crepe assault is probably better. It just doesn't have a cool ring to it as crepe murder. Uh, but it's certainly butchering these trees. 
uh, topping uh, done at an arbitrary location on the plant. This is OK. This is pilarding. And these, this tree is at the Elizabethan Gardens in Manteo. And it's probably 30 or 40 years old. Uh, you can see, you can't see very well, but you can see the kind of pollard heads there where they, uh, they come back and cut every year. So each time they come back, they don't violate that, part, that pollard head. They're using very small hand pruners to just trim off very small diameter sprouts, like about a half an inch in diameter. So there you can kind of get a better look at what kind of regrowth you get on there. And you can see that big pollard head on these trees. I don't recall the species. This was a picture I took out in Salt Lake City. You can see they had a number of trees there. I was really excited because they did a really great job here with pruning those trees. Now, lion's tailing is something that you often see uh, arborists do. And the reason they do it is because it's easier to work inside here than work outside here. But what's happened is, is they've created, and if you think about it, there's this very long branch with a little tuft at the end. And that's why they call it a lion's tail. So when the wind blows, this, tree is gonna, this branch is going to blow like crazy on this end and put a lot of pressure back here where it, was, where it joins to the main stem. This tree also has a structural problem because it has this co-dominant leader. And that would have been something we would have fixed when the plant was very young. And you can see they removed some pretty sizable limbs in order to cause this effect. So this actually makes this branch and this branch much more actually hazardous, so a much higher risk of failure. Especially think about when you get an ice storm. You've got a lot of weight on there. Even a heavy rainstorm where you get heavy winds in a, in a thunderstorm, certainly potential for, that to, for those branches to fail. So what do you remove? Obviously, dead limbs. That's like kind of a, a no-brainer, um, <clears throat> especially if they're high up in a tree. Uh, and if it's something high up in a tree and you don't feel confident being in the tree, uh, there are a lot of safety precautions that you have to undergo. I've seen some crazy photos. A lot of people send me crazy photos of people doing stupid stuff, mostly. Um, and those are uh, guys with ladders, ladders in the bucket of a uh, skid steer lifted as high as it goes and then a ladder up into the tree and then that one's tied on to another ladder. I mean, I've seen some crazy pictures. So you probably want to call in a certified arborist if you have tree, you know, branches you need to get out of the top of the tree. And certainly recommend that to your clients to call a, a certified arborist. Obviously, any kind of rubbing, any branches moving inward to the tree, like this probably should have been removed a while ago. And this is a multi-stem uh, plant. This is, I believe, a, a, I think it was a Cornus moss or Cornelian cherry dogwood. They're meant to be multi-stem, but you also don't want all this interference in here because they'll just continue to rub together and end up with some issues. All right, broken, dead suckers. Uh, and suckers are something that often form on trees for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of them are just prone to that, especially if it's a tree grafted onto a different type of rooting stock. Uh, you might get that. And directional growth. So the great thing about that is if you've got something interfering, like say on the left side of this picture and you have this branch coming out, you could reduce that branch or you could take it back to the collar and control the growth on that. And so you can often make one cut and solve a problem for a much longer period of time. So I'm sure many of you guys know what this is. This is uh, wax myrtle. Um, these are both on campus, and it's just interesting to see the different ways that you can maintain certain plants. You can maintain them as trees, or you can maintain them as shrubs, or kind of large shrubs, um, or just the low-growing uh, low growing plants. So lots of different options, and it depends on what kind of aesthetic you're looking for, uh, maybe what the function is in the landscape in that case. I love this picture. A lot of people don't like forsythia. I mean, to me, it's a happy plant. You see it in the spring blooming like crazy. It's really easy to maintain this, too. Of course, you see most people maintain it by shearing it all throughout the summer. You can certainly do that, but you guys know that what happens is you don't have many flowers on it the following season, because this one, of course, blooms on old season growth. Okay, But what a glorious plant to enter spring. And if you want to prune it, just cut it back to the ground, do a rejuvenative cut. And that's as easy as it can be. And you would do that after it blooms, OK, and then let it grow up for the next season. So with most shrubs, it depends, again, on what the function in the landscape is. If you're creating a hedge, you can certainly trim these to make a hedge. Uh, there's lots of other hedging plants that you can uh, put in as well. Um, 
certainly we've moved away from Fatinia or red tip because of the issues with that. I've seen some beautiful ones in isolation, but not uh, used as a hedge because the disease spreads so readily. So the whole point, too, of having shrubs is that they grow down to the ground. So you don't typically want to remove all of this. Again, it's a partly aesthetic. If you're looking for a more formal landscape, then you may do more shearing. There's a lot of different species of trees. Uh, the Europeans shear almost everything from sycamore to beech to uh, tilia. You name it. If they can shear it, they'll do it. Even very large mature trees, I, they use laser-driven uh, shears to, to prune them in exacting fashion. And some shrubs you don't really need or they don't like to be pruned much at all. Pieris is one of those that doesn't like to be pruned. You guys know what this plant is. This is Calicarpa. It's a summer bloomer. We don't care too much about the blooms except that they produce these really incredible fruit uh, in the fall. They're kind of an ungainly plant, though, and they are something that you can prune back to a rejuvenative cut uh, if you want to. Um, you can do that. Um, because they bloom on the current season growth, you can do that in late winter, early spring. And, and for here, that means probably um, April, March, somewhere, uh, somewhere in there, probably March in most cases. You just kind of got to watch your weather in your area. You can also prune them after they flower. It depends on, again, what you're trying to uh, do with that plant. Um, some of your clients may not like it if you prune an entire plant six inches above the ground. But you can, so in that case, you could take out a few of the older stems uh, down to the ground or six inches or so from the ground each year if you want. Uh, that kind of minimizes um, their concern about you doing that. Deciduous shrubs. This is a uh, double file viburnum. This is, was growing in my backyard in, um, in Ohio. And I called this plant my precious because nobody was allowed to touch this except for me. I'll just tell you a quick little story. I had a dog in the backyard. She was the laziest dog in the world. But one day, she got something crazy happened to her. She ran around the yard. She crashed into this plant and broke one of the huge stems of this plant. And you can see, it's not the best picture, but you can see this was a glorious plant. So you know what they say is the universal fix-all, duct tape. So I duct taped the stems together, and it actually grew back together, and it was perfect. So pretty cool. So I don't tout, uh, you know, trees and plants are amazing, so sometimes you can, you can fix them when you would think that you would have to just cut them back down. So I kind of look at deciduous shrubs in two ways, three-year cycle or the five-year cycle. And obviously a three-year cycle is something more that you might have to do with faster growing shrubs. Um, and and this, tree, this shrub, double file viburnum, is a pretty fast growing one. Um, so you kind of think of those in your yard or, or your client's yard that grow pretty quickly. Um, and so you can go in and you can prune it you know, each year after it flowers if you want, but, but then again remove most of the wood every three years or so. And that kind of helps revitalize the plant. A lot of plants grow, grow, and grow, and they get a little tired, so they may not bloom as well. Um, and that's what oftentimes we're planting shrubs in the landscape for is that bloom. So this five-year cycle for more slow-growing shrubs, something that takes a little bit longer to reach the size you're looking for. Many evergreens are, are probably fit in that category. Of course, here's a, a, a rose. This is a landscape rose, knockout rose. And I'm going to talk about roses in a couple minutes. But um, this can be done anytime. I've seen this done in, in late fall. I've seen it done in early spring. And it's, it's pretty harsh. But these, these plants are tough. They come right back uh, every year. And they'll bloom like crazy. This is a spirea in the bottom picture, another one that you can easily do rejuvenative pruning with. How about topiary? Um, this is from Pearl Friars Yard in South Carolina. If you've never been there, you've got to go there sometime. It's pretty incredible. Um, just the shapes and styles that he can come up with. All of his plants are evergreen, I believe, for the most part. And he's just done some incredible shearing uh, to get the plants to look like that. So uh, very formal. And it takes time and, and effort to get the plants to look like that. It's not just something that happens overnight. You also have to be careful because a lot of times with those plants that you shear and shear and shear, uh, at some point you end up with what kind of a veneer of green foliage on the outside. And it's very woody on the inside. So what I often recommend, and not necessarily for topiary, but for shearing plants, is you go in 
uh, every three or five years and open up some pockets in, in that plant to allow the sunlight to get down in there and produce some foliage in, uh, in the interior of the plant can really be helpful. So broadly, evergreens, when do you do this? And a lot of folks get very um, hesitant, particularly about trimming back uh, azaleas because they're afraid they're going to kill them. And I've done this many, many times, had discussions with my husband about why I shouldn't do it. As soon as he goes in the backyard, I just go ahead and do what I want to do. So there you have it. Um, and the plant is actually beautiful now. But a lot of times, you know, azaleas get really leggy. You get those real long stems that don't have much foliage except at the top. So you can cut them back. You can reduce them. But it gets a little tricky because you have those, it's, it's got three stems often coming out of one spot at the tip. So kind of the best way in my mind has been to cut them back down a few inches off the ground. Uh, in some cases, you may be able to, as I said, reduce them. If you can hide the cut a little bit, you may try doing that. Um, so you can, after they flower, you can go back and take every single stem off, three to six inches above the ground or you can take off the older stems at a time. Because, again, a lot of times it's kind of freaky. It freaks people out a little bit when you take an entire plant back to the ground, uh, or it's, even if it's 6 or 12 inches off the ground, they still kind of freak out. Now, the following season, it will probably produce some flowers, but not as many as it probably had been. And so um, the following year, it will produce flowers like crazy. So it will be absolutely beautiful. And it really will extend the longevity of that nice shape that you're looking for with foliage throughout the whole plant. It really will be, it really will be much lusher and just much more attractive when you do get rid of some of those little crazy gangly branches. Now, rhododendrons, the large leaf rhododendrons, if you trim them back really hard, they will not like you. Um, they, they, don't, um, they don't do as well with that. So I certainly suggest if you're trying to reduce the large leaf rhododendrons, you want to take them back a little bit at a time. Okay, and you should kind of do that over time. You can also pinch, uh, pinch them back, the stem, uh, any of the, the new growth, you can pinch it off. Uh, the same thing with the old spent flowers, you can pinch them off. And of course, when you do that, though, um, it takes a lot of time each year because you're producing more and more flowers every time you pinch back all those old flowers. My mother's been very upset with me for years because now it takes her three hours to do one shrub where it only used to take her one. <laughs> but she's got so many more flowers. So here's the Pieris I was talking about earlier, Edgeworthia, another plant um, that just absolutely gorgeous deciduous shrub grows like crazy, does require some uh, irrigation, some supplemental irrigation in the summer. They do tend to wilt heavily if you don't have uh, some supplemental irrigation. But really plants that don't need a whole lot of pruning. Um, usually you can control them with a little, particularly with the pieris, with a little bit of pinching. Uh, and again, you get big, long, straight shoots with this plant. But So you want to kind of encourage growth all the way down to the ground. So really not much pruning that you have to do. You might have to thin them out every so often, especially if uh, flower production begins to decline. So here we get to the roses. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys uh, try to grow floribundas, grandifloras, or hybrid teas anymore um, because they do require a lot more attention. I would love to have a garden of these, but just don't have the time myself. So you can cut them back to about 18 inches at the end of the growing season. Uh, in the spring, uh, you certainly want to cut back any blackened stems that you might have, any diseased uh, or dead issues. Um, I know that one of the things that I find even on shrub roses are thrips are a huge problem uh, that cause issues with, with the flowers uh, not uh, producing very well. So you want to be you know, kind of checking for those kinds of things. And I understand from uh, one of our entomologists here on campus that almost every flower has thrips in it. I don't know if that's true or not, but you guys can kind of explore that. Um, so you kind of obviously want to make sure the center is open, any crossovers, and, and you can take about a third of the wood out each year if you want to. Um, now obviously, I'm not going to talk about all the other things you have to do to maintain these to get good flower production, but uh, certainly um, 
pruning is, is fairly straightforward. Shrub roses, again, you can trim, the, trim the, these however you really want to. I found that each year I do trim back my, uh, my roses. I will trim, trim them back uh, at least to six inches off the ground uh, in most years. You, you don't, again, have to do that. Um, shrub roses, of course, we're talking about some of the knockouts, a lot of the other uh, older types, metalin, uh, there's some new metalin hybrids and a number of other uh, roses out there. Uh, just to kind of keep you um, up to date, uh, rose rosette has become a huge issue with knockout roses, particularly the double flowering knockouts. So if you're seeing any kind of weird growth, uh, reddish uh, foliage, bright reddish foliage on, on the new growth coming up, it's got a lot of thorns on it. I think there's a term for that, and I can't remember it. Thorniferous. I'm just making that up. But tons of uh, thorns and twisted foliage. The problem is, is there's not really much you can do for that, um, for that particular issue. Uh, it is carried by a very, very, very tiny little mite that's blown around uh, in the wind. Um, and if you leave any root behind, that can infect the next plants that you put in there. So you want to be real cautious with um, advising folks on, on that particular disease. Some of the other, uh, aside from the knockout, some of the other shrub roses are a little more uh, tolerant of that. Uh, but I have heard from many of our landscapers that they're finding issues with many of those plants. So you, you have to tear the plant out and destroy it. Uh, and again, as I said, it's hard to get every single one of those roots out of there. So just keep watch for that. Uh, it's interesting backstory here is they brought in the rose rosette virus in order to kill um, the wild roses, um, multiflora rose that's become so invasive. So that was not a really good idea, <laughs> as you might suspect. Okay, so you know. What is it? Good intentions pave the path to somewhere not good. All right, so neglected roses. Again, you want to remove anything dead um, and diseased, uh, obviously, as the, below it as far as you can. And obviously, when, any, when you're ever pruning anything that has a potential disease organism in it, in order to prevent it from spreading, you're going to have to clean your pruners between each cut. And I think one of the best ways to do that, the easiest way is instead of trying to mix up a batch of bleach and water, is to just take a, can, a spray can of Lysol with you and have that ready because you can just spray that on and, and kind of wipe it off a little bit. Just a, a real good idea. Uh, obviously, you're going to cut out any thin or spindly ones. If your client is okay with it, you can cut it back uh, and thin the canes and you can, or you can take all of them back. I did that in my brother's yard without asking. He was not happy with the outcome. But the next year, it bloomed great and had beautiful flowers on it. Pruning hydrangeas. Now, some of these are a little tricky, um, particularly the microphylla. But uh, arborescence is smooth. They're the paniculata. They flower on new wood. Um, so you could kind of prune them later in the fall or early in the spring. Now, I got to tell you guys, I saw the most incredible. That's supposed to be S-M-O-O-T-H just left out an H there, smooth hydrangea. I was in Silver Spring, Maryland a couple weekends ago, and I saw a, <coughs> a hydrangea paniculata. It was 15 feet tall and wide and had stems on it that were about four inches in diameter. It was absolutely gorgeous. The flowers were beautiful, kind of turning pink for the fall, an incredible plant. I'm going to try to get one in my yard. Hydrangea quercifolia is certainly the oak leaf hydrangea is another one you can prune after it blooms. Remember that that's a big growing plant and it's a very coarse plant and often it will lose its foliage along the bottom part of the trunk but it has that really cool exfoliating bark. But some folks may not like that so you can plant other things in front of it if you want to kind of soften it. Uh, I love the bark uh, but they do get sizable and you have to watch you know, based on the cultivar. And that of course brings uh, to mind, the point that I want to make sure I make is that we often put plants in a place where we cause ourselves to be out there working harder than we should have to. So you always want to, of course, remind everybody to plant a plant that's going to get the size that you want it to get when it's mature. And that will help minimize the amount of pruning that you'd have to do. Now, hydrangea macrophylla, and you've seen like the big, uh, the um, 
the ones that bloom all season, all summer or whatever. I've never seen ones that actually hold true to that. And if you guys have, I'd love to hear about them or send me some pictures or something. Um, but uh, ever summer, I can't remember the exact name of some of those cultivars. But uh, certainly, they're a little tricky because you'll have some flowers that bloom on new growth, some flowers that bloom on old growth. And if you get to a spot where they're a little bit iffy in the cold hardiness department, then you may have branches that die all the way back to the ground. And we had these in Ohio, and people tried to grow macrophylla, and most of the time all you got was a big, beautiful green leafed shrub. You never got blooms because the stems would die back. Now, they would grow back every year, but they lost all their blooms. So you want to kind of just be cautious about what you've got. But a great way to encourage more blooms is to take off that primary bloom head, the very big one that's, that's the first blooms that come out. You can remove that back to the, um, the next lateral buds. And that will release the hormones and allow the rest of the flower buds along the stem to bloom. Uh, obviously, when you do that, though, they're going to tend to be a little bit smaller in diameter than the first big buds that formed. So keep in mind that it depends on the cultivar. Uh, I have seen people try to kind of cage these and put mulch or put, not mulch, leaves in there or burlap around them to try to minimize uh, the cold damage. And that usually does not work very well. So. Um, if you get a really hard winter, you might have a plant the falling season that may not bloom. So just a few more things. Uh, Subshrubs. Uh, this one is uh, Russian sage or Parvskaya and, of course, an ornamental grass. Um, I just saw somebody that just pruned all of their ornamental grasses back down to the ground just this last week, and I questioned why. Uh, they were panicum or miscanthus, uh, some of those. Uh, and a lot of it, I guess, depends on what the preference is. So with ornamental grasses in particular, I always recommend cutting them back to the ground in the late winter, early spring. Now, a lot of times you'll get some that, because they're really tall, they'll break over with ice or snow or weight or whatever. And that's a different story. Certainly take them down if they become really unattractive. But to me, the whole point of ornamental grasses is, is is at least three or if not four season growth. So you have these great seed heads, and the birds love them. Uh, so kind of leaving them out provides some habitat and provides you with a little bit of color, uh, at least uh, something to look at in the winter. But you can certainly uh, cut them, you know, certainly if, if they're falling apart, cut them back. But I usually like to recommend trying to wait until uh, at least the spring, late winter, if possible. Now, everybody knows if you get a big donut forming in the middle of your plant, that means it's time to divide it. Uh, and that's not always an easy task. For those of you guys that have done it, you probably know what I'm talking about. I have actually used a chainsaw to cut apart uh, pampas grass to divide it because it's just not very easy to do. <laughs> so be careful out there. And uh, yeah, but dividing it will really help minimize this. And I think cutting them back, too, allows you to see what's going on in there. And I see a lot of a lot of grasses in my neighborhood that just don't look at all like they could because they haven't been maintained well. OK? Uh, and as far as the subshrubs, we're going to, uh, certainly that's part of Skyva. I wanted to show you a couple of others. Um, this is uh, Caryopteris or blue mist spirea, it's sometimes called it's blooming, probably still a little bit right now. Uh, nice late bloomer, um, lavender, of course, uh, Budlia, and um, Salvia. And I know some folks that will prune some of these back in the fall. Um, and you can do that, but I'd like to wait for most of these to see what happens in the spring. Because a subshrub is essentially mostly a woody plant with herbaceous top to it. And so when, it, when you get to spring and things are starting to grow, you want to see what's actually alive on the plant, particularly this salvia gregii, because we're really stretching, in some cases, its hardiness zone here. And so uh, last year, I found a lot of plants that died back to the ground. And one thing to keep in mind, particularly with salvia gregii, is it needs a really well-drained soil. Um, and, and I find that tends to be one of the other problems with this plant. Um, it needs that nice, well-drained soil. So to kind of wrap it up, the key is knowing what plant that you have, 
what level of pruning that plant can take, what will happen if you prune too much, um, how will it respond if you prune it, which directions will it grow, if it's an oppositely arranged plant, you know it's going to sprout into many different directions so that you're actually encouraging more growth. Um, Anytime you reduce a branch, you take the tip off of it back to a lateral, you're actually slowing the growth. If you thin it, you're actually uh, increasing the growth. Because if you think about it, all a branch needs is more sunlight in order to grow bigger. And so if you thin a plant out, you're getting more sunlight in there. And so it will actually, those branches will get larger in diameter and become more, and essentially be more vigorous. But if you tip it back or head it back, reduce it back to a lateral branch, you're going to actually kind of, it's called subordination, and you're going to slow the growth down on that plant. So again, kind of ask yourself why you're doing that pruning, and remember that pruning is wounding. So making as few cuts as possible and as small a cuts as possible is always the best way to go with plants. So if you guys have some questions you want to throw at me, let me know. You can always email me since I'm here at the university. There you see my email address up there, so you're certainly welcome to email me. I could talk for three days on pruning. <laughs> Do we have any questions from Emma? All right. You can type them in the chat box for another minute or so if it takes you a while to think up questions. Whoops. Um, I see Mike is back from class. We're finally back on track after an interesting morning, so I think we'll let uh, Mike discuss current disease issues. Mike, will you navigate to your slides? They're going to be at the end. Sure. And while I do that, I see that there's a question from Sean Banks there. When right. would you prune Encore? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I saw that too. When would you prune Encore azaleas? So that's a great question, Sean, uh, of course, because they bloom in the spring and they bloom in the fall. So my suggestion is, again, to ask yourself why you're pruning them. Uh, if, you really, um, if you really are trying to get uh, them you know, back in track, you've you got a lot of leggy branches on them, I would say prune them in, in the spring after they bloom. Yeah, yes, you're going to cut all, and I'm not saying cut the whole thing down. This is where I would probably institute a, uh, a few branches at a time kind of reduction pruning, uh, rejuvenation pruning, because then you'll still get some blooms in the fall. But if you cut, if you feel like you have to do an entire rejuvenation, then obviously you're going to minimize, you're not going to have any blooms probably, or very few blooms by the fall. Um, but that's a great question, yeah. Um, that's what I got for you. You bet, Sean. Take care. All right. Can everybody hear me? Let's see if you could uh, I'll switch back to the green checks here. Uh, hold on, tools. All right. Give me a green check there if you can hear me. All right. Very good. Well, yes, it has been an interesting morning getting things started here, then dashing off to class and dashing back here. But now we are back on track. And I want to start out with a mystery photo, something a little bit like an enchanted forest here. And we'll take up this picture again in a little while, but just tease you with what could this possibly be. Also in the sort of mysterious, creepy-looking department. We have a picture that was sent in by Tom Glasgow from Craven County on an oak branch. And these little things here are not the blob revisited, nor are they little micro brains of something growing out of the tree. But it turns out this is a fairly common group of wood decay fungi. This one is probably hypoxylin, some species of the genus hypoxylin. And I was particularly interested in this one when at the park on Sunday with the family, we found some of this on some downed branches as well and brought it in, looked at it. Chuck Hodges looked at it and made the identification. So that's probably what Tom had here on his oak branch that he submitted also. And the question that he had was whether it was actually damaging the bark. No, it was whether it was damaging only the bark or actually causing wood decay. And these are wood decay fungi. They're not related 
particularly closely to the ones we usually see, the shelf fungi, which are basidiomycetes, where these are ascomycetes. But they are causing wood decay. Fortunately, though, in most cases, and I think this is generally true of oaks around here, they're not going to be a primary pathogen causing disease. Some of its relatives in some circumstances, um, some hosts can be can be disease causing pathogens, but in this case, it's nothing really to worry about. You have to want to assume the crown was thinning. Excuse me. <clears throat> Since the crown was thinning, you'd want to ask other questions about what's happening down with the roots of the soil that may be causing the general decline. I don't often talk about turf diseases, but I don't want my ignorance to keep the plants, pests, and pathogens audience in the dark. So I asked Lee Butler what would be a good disease to talk about and mention in terms of turf for this time of year. And this is the one that he talked about. And it, it turns out that this is a cool season problem of warm season turf. This is somewhere down in the extreme southeast part of the state. And from the looks of it, it was sometime in the late spring. Not sure what turf this would have been, but does anybody recognize this disease? If not, yes, Danny, that is what it is. This is large patch. Again, this is a problem on warm season grasses, such as centipede, St. Augustine, Bermuda, and Zoysia. It's caused by a fungus called Rhizoctonia solani, which you may recognize is the same fungus that causes uh, brown patch on fescue and cool season grasses during the warm months. But it's not the exact same type. It belongs to a different group within that species. So it's interesting that whatever the environment is that's unfavorable to that particular, particular type of grass is when it's going to have disease problems. So in this case, we're talking about the cooler months when we have problems on the warm season grasses. The infection in this case is occurring on the leaf sheaths where the stones touch the ground. So that's where Lee looks when he diagnoses this particular one. You can see in the photograph there some of the, the damaged, dead, necrotic leaf sheath tissue from the infection of this fungus. It, as the name suggests, will develop into large patches in the lawn during the cooler weather. What should you do about it? Well, the thing that you can do, it turns out, is make fungicide applications in the fall. And there's the link to the Turf Files website. If you don't get the whole thing there, you can just go to www.turffiles.ncsu.edu and navigate from there. It's a very extensive, thorough website about not only turf disease problems, but other issues and how to select turf grasses. The trick with this is that we're running out of time to make any kind of applications against this disease. It has to be done when things start to cool off, so the soil temperature is being less than 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But it has to happen before the first frost, which sounds like it's coming to our area this weekend. What happens is if the plant gets frosted, it's not going to absorb the fungicide, and you won't get any control. Now, because springtime is also cool, and not favorable to the warm season grasses. This can be a problem in the spring, but by then it's too late to make any effective application against the disease. This is a sprig of euonymus that was brought in by our colleague here, Dr. Chuck Hodges, from his own yard. And it's interesting. This is a problem that we usually see in nurseries and greenhouses. But here it was in a home landscape. And let me let you decide what it is. So I've changed the polling now to, instead of a green check, you'll have your choices A through E. And take a second and vote on what you think this is. I tried to make the A, B, C go in order. So A, a fungus, B, bacterium, et cetera.
All right, folks seem to be a little timid this morning. We've got only about 13 votes there. All right. It turns out that it is not a fungus. There was no evidence of bacteria. I didn't see any euonymus scale there. Uh, dogs, that was just to throw you off because it happened to have a D in it, but nobody bit. No pun intended. In fact, yes, this is edema. So three folks managed uh, to choose edema, and that is correct. What is edema? Well, it's something that we see uh, in the form of spots, and they are blister-like on the underside of the leaf when they are fresh. As they dry out, though, they turn sort of a corky. And this is typical on thick leaf plants like euonymus, like ligustrum here, and even geranium, especially the ivy leaf geranium is quite susceptible to this. The usual explanation, and this can happen any time of year, but the basic explanation is that when you have cool, cloudy weather and warm, moist roots, those roots are absorbing and pushing water up in the plant. And they're doing it too fast for that water to be able to be transpired out under those cool, cloudy conditions. The cells of the leaf fill with water, become uh, enlarged, you get the blisters, and then when those cells burst and dry, you get the sort of a corky look to it. So the important thing here is that this is not an infectious disease. It will not spread on the plant or to other plants. It's an environmental condition. Uh, yes, the question here was, can this happen on a, house, a jade plant in the house? Uh, yes, it can happen on jade plant. We have diagnosed it that way. If your conditions are correct for that to happen, yes. I've also seen it on agave from a nursery here, a greenhouse nursery producer here. So it can happen on a lot of different kinds of plants. I decided to do a little section here on peony problems, again inspired by a plant that Dr. Chuck Hodges brought in, but then I expanded that to talk about peony problems, not just this time of year, but that occur at other times of year as well. And let me start out with this one that came from his Wake County home this month, which is called by two names. Uh, in the smaller spots, it would go by the name of measles, and the larger version of it is red blotch. The spots look much brighter red in some cases, I suspect, when they are fresher and kind of dull to a reddish brown by this time of year. But what I want to do is pull you and ask if you've seen it. So again, a review of where your pointers are in the, if you haven't moved it, the little menu bar for, or icon bar for different features in Collaborate. You'll notice that there's one that looks like a Starburst reviews. And if you click on that Starburst, you get a selection of other choices for little icons that can be applied to the whiteboard. In this case, we'll do it this way. Now, don't do it yet, which we get the map up. But if you have seen this leaf blotch or measles disease on Peony, we'll have you put a green check on the map. If you have peonies but have not seen this disease, then a smiley face. And if you do not have peonies grown in your area, then choose the red X to place on the map here. So give everybody a chance to pull out the appropriate symbol and apply it to the map. All right, the sunburst, I'm not sure what the meaning is there. If you, if you click on that sunburst, you can change it to one of the other symbols to let us know. Again, green check if you've seen this disease. 
smiley face if you have peonies but have not seen the disease, and red X if you don't have peonies around. All right, this is very interesting, in part because of the scattered distribution of peony uh, growers, but also because this disease, you're seeing it farther east than we have seen it in terms of samples at the clinic. And I will take the opportunity also to reveal the mystery photo. This is taken under the microscope. And those little trees are actually very, very small. Well, they're called canidiophores, or the little stems. And then the spores produced on them are the green canidia in chains, so the leaves of this tree here. The fungus is called Graphiopsis chlorocephala, although you may know by its uh, older name, which was, um, well, i put it up in the next slide, but Cladosporium peony. And this is taken on the surface of the peony leaf that I showed in the first picture. A quick rundown on this disease then. It's caused by a fungus. There are the names again. Graphiopsis chlorocephala is the current name. Chloro meaning in yellowish green. Cephala meaning head. So that's why those little trees have that little green head look to them. I only had seen it on samples or looking at the computer here from Wake County West, but I see that it's actually farther east. And most of the samples that we have have been submitted in August, but as you can tell from the one in the picture, that it's still out there even in October. Here's another peony foliar problem. This one is pretty classic, actually. We see this mosaic pattern. This one came from a nursery in Wake County this year. But you could see it on, also on um, plants in the landscape, potentially. Anybody know what this one is? Or what group of diseases it belongs to? Yes, Charlotte, this is, in fact is virus, and Sean. This is a virus infection. We didn't confirm it on this, but it's, it's so classic based on symptoms that this is probably tobacco rattle virus, a wonderful name, and something that you want to be careful of when you are propagating and bringing plants into the landscape that they are free of this disease. Because once it's infected, there's nothing you can do. Powdery mildew can also get on petunia. Chuck said that it, his landscape, he'd never seen it this thick on his petunias. I'm sorry, on his uh, peonies. And here's a couple of diseases that I've seen only once each. Uh, Discosia leaf spot here. Notice that the spots are much more distinct. They're tan in the center. And if you look very closely under the hand lens or the microscope, you'll see the black fruiting bodies there, quite different from what we saw with the measles or the leaf blotch, both in terms of symptoms and in terms of the fungal sign here. But this is caused by a fungus called Discosia. This was, yes, I believe a landscape bed in Forsyth County a couple of years ago. This is a sample that came in from a nursery. <clears throat> Much different sort of spot from the other two. Notice the general tan brown dead tissue, but also the sort of concentric rings in it. Since I haven't seen it enough times, I can't say that that's going to always be present. But this turned out to have a couple of fungi in the Cercospora group. One of them was Pseudocercospora vericolor, and the other possibly present was Cercospora peony. So except for the virus there, we are talking about basically fungal diseases on peony that we would worry about. And when you're managing these, the key is to use cultural control, basically two areas. One is minimizing your leaf wetness, so make sure the plants have enough spacing so that air circulation can keep the leaf wetness to a minimum, and avoiding overhead irrigation and late day watering. We preach that pretty often. And further, don't work the beds when they're wet because you may spread the spores around with some of these things. The other important is, the other part they give would be sanitation to remove and destroy diseased leaves promptly. And in the fall, do your cleanup, not just your peonies, but your irises and any other hardy perennials. Get those leaves cleaned up and 
if the leaves are diseased, do not compost them. If the problems do persist, in spite of your cultural controls, you may consider using fungicides on varieties that have had problems in the past once the growth resumes next spring. For example, something containing mancozeb will have effectiveness on a wide range of the uh, fungal leaf spots, although not the powdery mildew. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you still have problems, then consider switching to a variety that's less susceptible to these diseases. All right, one disease that is very important on peony, but we don't really see it on any of our landscape samples. I've only seen it from the folks here on campus who are working with post-harvest, but is botrytis blight on peony. And I actually heard a very interesting talk at a conference at the end of last month about how this has become a problem with peony growers in Alaska, where they're trying to produce flowers for the high paying uh, wedding market when they're in season up there. But they can be shipped all around the world. Here's a case of a cut flower producer in Beaufort County, and we had these spots on it, but this appears to have been not a disease at all, but some kind of herbicide injury, which is also what may have gone wrong here. In a case like this, you want to make sure you don't have some kind of root problem, a soil problem, crown rot, something like that, although I would expect wilting as well. The conclusion on this sample was, unless, Joanna, you have new information to share, that they may have used some glyphosate in their weed control efforts that got on these plants and injured them. The good news is that when I asked uh, for an update on this, oh yes, Joanna says she confirms that that was the, uh, the update, because we didn't find anything in terms of diseases here. But the good news is that you can see, and then among the irises here, some nice peonies, so the plants did recover, at least these did recover this year. A few things uh, to look out for in the next few months. Things are slowing down, but there are still some diseases that will be active. Vegetables, we're mostly talking about the crucifers now, but be aware of sclerotinia stem rot and also black rot, which is a bacterium, xanthomonas, a few other diseases that can occur on these kinds of plants. On woody ornamentals, entomosporium leaf spot on Indian hawthorn, will still be visible. As other plants lose their leaves, we'll start to notice those humble evergreens that we don't pay much attention to otherwise. So you may see some, I'll just lump it under Cercospora leaf spot on the privets. You can see the photograph on the left here. Not a serious issue for the long-term health of the plant. But we will be seeing more serious things, of course, as root systems that have been decaying finally can't handle it and Phytophthora root rot and Armillaria root rot will be causing the uh, decline of some of our woodies. If you're up in the mountains looking at spruces, Rhizosphera needle cast is something you can still be watching for in the waning months of the year. And we still have to always harp on this idea of watching for boxwood blight. The classic leaf symptom is shown in the upper right there, although Sometimes I've been seeing it on samples where we don't have that uh, the one most recently didn't have the classic leaf spots. It did have the stem streaks and defoliation, but it was nevertheless boxwood blight. And in the flower beds, pansy and viola are main things in the wintertime, and black root rot is one of their nemeses, as well as in some cases botrytis, botrytis blight, which you can see pictured on the right in the wet weather, in the cool weather. With that, I will be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Mike. Um, we'll leave it open for questions for a couple minutes. I'm going to try to navigate back to one of the early slides or we're waiting for questions to come into Mike. Let's see if I can do that. Um, there we go. Um, this. Um, was this slide was showing um, prior to the start of the uh, session this morning, and some of you may have missed it, but I don't think if this is something you want to do, I don't think you'd want to miss it. Um, this slide that Lucy sent us this morning um, announcing 
reminding about the 2015 Extension Master Gardener study tour in Costa Rica. Sounds like it'll be a really wonderful um, event for anybody who's interested in attending. So I just just wanted to make sure that y'all saw that before we uh, signed off today. And it looks like Mike does have a couple questions to answer. <laughs> All right, I I just see the one here, inside browning of cypress. We did see this year a lot of what we called internal browning, and I assume that you're talking about Leyland cypress. If not, you can uh, type that in. But where the needles in the interior portion and the lower reaches of the plant would turn brown. And Chuck had quite a few of these samples this year and could not really find any disease to explain it, as far as I know. And we just concluded that this is some kind of an environmental issue. Shading, of course, will eventually cause plants to lose their needles. But I can't explain it 100% because I've seen some nice looking Leyland that you would expect that there would have been some shading going on and losing lower needles, whereas uh, it doesn't occur in every case. So that the jury is still a little bit out, but as far as we know, it is an environmental type problem and not a disease. But of course, there are quite a few things. Uh, ceridium canker, which th will kill the tips, but that's not the interior foliage. And you want to be aware of any canker diseases that may be killing entire branches. Or if the whole thing starts to wilt, then you know you've got some kind of a root problem, Armillaria phytophthora. Right. If there are no other questions, I think we um, might be about ready to wrap up. Thanks, everybody, for their patience this morning with all our little technological glitches. I want to especially thank uh, Mike Munster for um, taking over the moderating early in the session and for uh, Matt Bertone to uh, um, swiftly uh, moving his talk to the beginning of the session today. Um, Glad everything worked out, and thanks, everybody, for their patience.